uh, let's get going with the session. Um, Stefan uh, is going to be, he's going to do the main presentation today, but he's going to be a little late. So um, I will use the time uh, productively before he comes um, to maybe go over some questions or some other things. But first of all, um, let me tell you, and I don't know, um, I, I'm pretty sure people have not addressed this yet. Um, doing something like this, doing a project like this, really uh, requires mindset, right? It's, it requires a mindset that has initiative, that just does things, that just thinks about um, what can we do? How can we get things going? And you're all very young. Um, you are probably still developing your mindset to that in that regard. And let me tell you that most people, most adults don't have such a mindset. Most adults are basically in a position where they just, you know, move in a, in a normal environment that they're used to. So basically, it's really easy at some point to settle into an environment where everything is known to you, where you know where your, you know, where your borders are, uh, what you have to do, what is expected of you, and something like that. But um, what we are doing here is really going beyond those borders. You know, we are we are basically doing something that other people would say this can't be done. You know, or people up there, people in the government need to do it or something like that. People up high uh, or they, you know, someone has to do it, but not me. And um, it's really important to understand that. It's really important that such a project, and it's, it's a big thing, it's really something that many people would not dare to try. It's important that you understand that such a, people, such a project needs initiative from your side. And um, this is something that um, I can't really stress enough because uh, what, what it really needs is that you step up and make it your project, that you step up with your ideas and uh, not just follow uh, orders from us. Don't expect us to tell you everything. Our role in this project is really to be there and to help you if you need any help. So you can always come to us and you can always request help. But it is really important that you start taking initiative, that you start coming up with ideas, that you start, you know, walking a few steps in the direction that you think is good. Yeah. And um, this is a tremendous experience that will be extremely valuable for later as well, because um, with initiative, you can do so much that most people would never try. Yeah. Um, I said that because it's this is really one of the, the essential things for me that is really, really important that I think uh, that you will take away from this project if you do it right, that you will be in a position where you will have done something incredible that most people wouldn't even do. And um, that will actually make it much, much easier to do other things like this, other things that are that sounds a little weird and crazy and, you know, where people say, okay, yeah, the government needs to do it or something like that. But you will be able to initiate something like that. Okay, enough said about that. Um, I would like to go over some ideas and questions with you before Stefan arrives, right? So are there at this point anything any is there anything that you are unsure about anything that you say hey we don't know about about we sorry we don't know enough about this topic in order to do it right or we need to more need we need to find out more about this or we need more research on this or we need more input on this or there's something that is really unclear to me about this is there anything like that or is everything clear right now let's go around with some questions I personally can't think of much to really ask about currently, so okay, that's my so, <laughs> But thanks for speaking up. Um, do you, let, yeah. let me ask. Let me ask you. Um, so, sure. <laughs> do you um, do you have a vague um, idea of how you would do the planting, for instance, or is that yeah. still very yeah, you do? cool? I mean, have you done that before? 
Have, have we planted um, a tree before? Not a tree, but crops, yeah. But crops, okay, cool. So I, I'm so, just thinking it should be something similar. So, yeah. Great. I, do you have farming experience or what? A little bit, yeah. Okay, how come? Do you have like, uh, does your family do farming? Or? Um, we do own a field in uh, this place called Marsalfon. Okay, is, is, I, I I know yeah. where Marsalfon is. Oh, okay. Yeah, I've um, been there. It's yes. fine. Yeah, we have a, a plot of land there and we grow some plants there. We also have Excellent. gardens and stuff and in front of a house and so I manage those on the occasion. That's about mm -hmm. it. The silence was getting quite painful. Uh, so I, I felt like I had to say something at that point. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. I, thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm happy if I don't have to hold a monologue here. So that's cool. Is there anyone else who has... <laughs> thanks. Is there anyone else who has uh, planting experience in any, in any uh, way? You know, even if it's not trees, but, you know, like crops or flowers? I, yes, I also have some planting experience. Okay. What do you plant or what did you plant in the past? Um, my dad has a couple fields that I help him manage sometimes. We have planted trees before a couple years ago, but now it's mostly just crops like vegetables and stuff. Oh, nice. And where's this? Where's the field? Um, it's by the harbor in Mjar. Okay. Also a place I know. I didn't know they had fields there. It's, it's just... <laughs> but yeah. Cool. So that's that's extremely helpful because then you might be able to guide the others a little in, in planting. I mean, I'm sure there are some of some of you who, have, who are going to do that for the first time. Who here is going to plant for the first time? Who has never done any planting in any sort? So actually, the only planting I've ever done was like in my garden, just like vegetables or fruits, um, but not like specific trees or plants. Yeah. Okay, and did that turn out well? Did, did the vegetables actually, you know, come out as something that you could harvest and eat? Some of them, most of them, but not always. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But I think that yeah. depends on the weather in Germany, so uh, it wasn't always my fault. <laughs> mm -hmm. So question for the, for the German participants. Um, has any of you ever been to Malta? doesn't look like it big silence. okay so since no one said something before um i've never been to malta but i'm very excited uh for this trip mm -hmm. yeah i think we all are i think it's it's going to be really really exciting it's malta is of course very very different from germany and then gozo in particular is even you know it's even different from malta again so um you know that will be quite an experience i think um Okay, moving on to the next questions. Has anyone thought about how to um, do some marketing and make this project public and tell others about it? Has anyone had some ideas already of how we can make it visible? Um, Just wild know, ideas at this point. Yeah, go ahead. I know there's already an Instagram page set up. I was thinking maybe we could expand to other social media, particularly Facebook, since there you can organize events and stuff. That's true. I mean, there's always the question who's using Facebook, right? I mean, usually older people are using Facebook. I don't know. Or is your generation using Facebook, any of you? So I surprisingly know quite a few people my age who do use Facebook. Okay. Okay. It's getting less in, the, in your age group. But um, if, if you feel like that you can reach people there, then by all means, we should use Facebook, definitely. I'm, so are you... Sorry go ahead. Uh, Go ahead, Jamie. Facebook is a really prominent like social media in Malta. People, mm -hmm. A lot of people use it. I don't typically use it, but I do have Messenger, which is still basically Facebook. So, I mean, it's very yeah. popular, essentially. Okay. In that case, I mean, we always need to look at what... Um, you know, basically how we reach our target groups. And if you say locally, Facebook is still very relevant because we reach a lot of people, then by all means, we need to use it. So absolutely. So um, social media um, is, is stronger. Do you have, does anyone here have some experience um, actually doing a social media campaign, actually getting a message out on social media? 
and I don't mean just using it for fun and posting pictures of your lunch or something like that, but um, actually, um, you know, letting people know about a product, letting people know about an initiative or something like that. Do you, does anyone here have experience with that on social media? Any social media? So I have a bit of experience because I volunteer and I have to promote some things sometimes, but I'm not like the main person who controls it. So I only have a bit mm -hmm. of experience. Okay, can may I ask what you're um, promoting on social media? Um, I don't know if you know the organization, but it's called UNICEF. So we promote like children rights and of course. so on. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and so you are you are writing um contributions for the social media platforms or, or what do you do? As so yeah, we have an Instagram account and also a TikTok account. And mm -hmm. then we pop it, um that we do like some events where we have to find something to write articles about and then we just like do different kinds of posts to promote what's going on on that particular day or what events we are doing so i guess we're just kind of marketing the importance of the matter at hand yeah absolutely sounds good um in which social media are you using you um said tiktok I and instagram instagram okay Cool. Yeah. yeah, that's that's cool. I mean, people who have a little experience could maybe um, help others understand um, how to do that, right? Because um, not everyone is so well versed in this. Um, what kind of pictures are you using in your um, posts for UNICEF? Uh, so it depends. We sometimes just do like slides where we write stuff about maybe articles for example we had an event where it was uh, the red hand day it's for like child soldiers so that was one kind of example then we do like stories or reels or shorts just showing like the events for example we had a stand on like our city and just promoting mm -hmm. what we do like many diff uh, different yeah i don't know how you can just say it but we try to like communicate as much as possible that we do. And like, also if we have a meeting, just like collecting ideas, we try to like put us, put up a story to just show what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Cool. And how often do you uh, post something there? Um, That I don't really know because. Just I'm... roughly, roughly. Is it roughly. more like once a week, several times a week? Several times a week, but I'm, not that often i just do it sometimes because mm -hmm. we have like many different types because you have to like maybe sign in on what you're doing but i think in the end like a story each day mm -hmm. and it depends as i said like what kind of matters are right so we'll we'll see how we can get that done of course um I think it's important in our case that we prepare something on social media in advance that we explain what this is about, maybe build up some following. And then when we actually do the planting, that intense week, we should probably communicate every day and show people what's going on with pictures, with articles, but also with short videos and stuff like that. So yeah, that's definitely something we need to do. Are there any other ideas um, apart from social media how we can reach out and um, get people's attention? So I had actually an idea um, to okay. sell maybe uh, cakes or something at our school. So to raise attention at our school specifically and maybe okay. um, the other school can also do it too. And so we have like um, all around our cities um, this topic gets like more attention from others that that's a pretty cool idea if you want to sell cake um that of course cake gets people's attention <laughs> because that's that's pretty cool it's also a way to uh, raise some money um my question here would be is do you have any idea how to get the message across because like the cake doesn't you know the cake yeah, doesn't have actually, writing on it, um, I think. <laughs> but yeah, go ahead. We did something like this before for another um for another topic, but uh, maybe we could create a little um cakes with uh, a tree on it or with um our logos on it, mm -hmm. or maybe mm -hmm. we can also design posters and post them all around in school to send the message or 
maybe to make clear that um, the climate change is like a cruel thing and we have to stop it and therefore we can do something and maybe that's the message we should uh, get all around. I, I think that's a fantastic idea. Maybe you could also do a little flyer with it or something that when you when people buy a cake at the same time, you know, it comes with a flyer that explains, um, you know, basically this is a, you know, this is a tree cake, why it, it supports trees in Gozo or something. Like that. So something that catches their attention and a little text that, you know, that actually tells them a little about, you know, what this is and where the money goes that they just spent on this cake, you know. And it could be, you know, you could start with a positive message, you know, like something like you could feel, you can feel good about eating this cake. Why? And then you explain why, because their money is supporting the forest or something like that. So things like that are excellent ideas and they are um, wonderful initiatives on a local level um, that you can definitely do. Hi, Stefan. Hi. Hi. So... Don't worry, we are, we, we've talked a little about ideas for marketing, for being present, for getting the message across. I'm wrapping that up now and then I'm handing over to you. So you have five minutes to set up and then you can just take over from me, okay? Yeah, easy, thank you. All right. Um, any other ideas? So we have the social media ideas, we have the cake idea, which is, I think, a really, really original idea and really nice, um, especially getting attention on a local level. That's that's pretty cool. Any other idea how we can yeah. grab um, people's attention? Um, yeah. I think we should use uh, the newspaper for mm -hmm. us because many people uh, read this and it's way more serious when mm -hmm. social media, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, newspaper readership is going down, but it is still an enormous you know, amount of people that newspapers can reach. So even though it is, you know, not as big as it used to be, it's still something we should pay attention to. So do you have any idea how to reach the newspaper? I think um, we, um, for us, our good point we have is that this is an a uh, special project, um, an important project, like with the climate change is pretty interesting. So mm -hmm. I think the newspaper could be interested to spread this information also about tiny forests. Like it's not a um, much known thing. So I think the newspaper could also be interested in making an article about um, tiny forests and also like saying a, saying something about our project. I definitely think you're right. The newspaper would be interested, but w once again, my question is, how would how would you reach them? How would you reach the newspaper? Do you have any idea? Um, I already know that um, our teacher in Germany um, talked with. Um, one newspaper, but it's a local newspaper, not that big. Mm -hmm. um, so there is already a um, connection. Um, mm -hmm. But could also try to get to a bigger newspaper by writing a letter, for example. Or if we already, um, maybe we could ask um, friends or the people uh, who are in this project if they know someone who works there and maybe yeah. we can get our connection like this. Yeah, fantastic idea. So basically networking, you know, ask somebody who knows someone. That's always a great idea because that's always a quick way in if you manage to find someone. I also like the idea of just reaching out to newspapers and finding out if they're interested, you know, um, Letter might, uh, you know, take a lot of time, but email is definitely something that newspapers use a lot. So, you know, it's not difficult to find out um, an email address of a newspaper. And maybe you can at some point write an email, you know, saying, hey, we have this really interesting project. We are doing something about climate change. You know, make sure to mention the important things that they want to hear in the first line of your email or in the subject of your email and say, would you be interested in getting an article on this? You know, and here's my contact. We'd like to 
you know, get this in a newspaper. And then if you write an email, you can send it out to 20, 30 different newspapers, you know, even big ones. You know, the worst that can happen is that they ignore you, but you haven't really lost anything. And maybe two or three will pick this up and say, hey, this sounds really interesting. Make sure to mention that it's a, a student initiative, that it's, you know, young people doing something about climate change, because there are a lot of topics that are that resonate really well with newspapers. So I really love that idea. And this is something you should really think about and develop as well. OK, right, Stefan, I'm handing over to you. Um, you should have all the rights to share your screen and uh, do a presentation and let me know if you need anything else. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, let's see. Here seems to work. All right, so good evening and welcome to the last lecture of the series, I think, at least from my side, it's definitely the last. Um, and just to sum up what we were talking about last time, um, yeah, quick reminder. So uh, we were talking about the different soil materials and biomasses and their properties. Um, yeah, to improve the soil quality in a proper way in order to implement a tiny forest on that new constructed uh, improved soil. So uh, last time we just missed the last slide of this topic block, which is the summary and uh, the summary of the materials you would need for a unit of 100 square meters of uh, tiny forest or Miyawaki forest. So you could calculate <clears throat> with an amount, especially on dry and poor soils, which is probably the case in Gozo, uh, of 10 to 15 cubic meters of extra material. Um, and yeah, depending on what materials you have access to in your area, could be a mixture of local biomass, uh, of compost or manure and biochar. We talked about all these materials and their properties last time. So yeah, with uh, all these different materials, we want to uh, improve the water holding capacity, the amount of humus, the, we want to lose the soil and give structure to the soil, and we want to support the microbiology in the soil. Um, and I think and hope you remember uh, like the different layers of a, yeah, of a forest soil when it is natural grown. And uh, you remember that there is this layer of topsoil where you have a high amount of humus. Then you have this subsoil, these lower areas with a lower amount of humus, but still some structure and yeah, a zone where the roots still penetrate into. Um, and yeah, at the top, the mulching layer for sure. And uh, what our suggestion is, if you are able to uh, manage the soil preparation like that, this is only a suggestion. You can also do it like a little um, yeah, more low-tech way. But if it's possible, and I will show some videos of examples how to do it later, uh, we want to bring like compost or manure only into the topsoil because there's still like oxygen in this loosened soil and the humus and the microbiology, which is in the compost, we would like to have this, yeah, in this top soil layer between zero and 30 to 40 centimeters. And then if it's a dry and compacted soil, we want to bring some biomass. Uh, we were talking about straw or wood chips or rice shells or any other biomass, which gives structure to the soil, brings air to the soil, holds water and slowly decomposes and also for give free nutrition. We want to have this kind of material in the lower areas of the soil between 40 and 100 centimeters. And the topic with biochar, I was talking a little bit about it. I don't know if you are, able, you are going to be able to produce your own biochar or if there is even a producer of proper biochar. Um, if you have it like optional, you could add this into both, uh, both layers, topsoil and subsoil layer. And optional, we were also talking about it. 
Uh, you could brew a compost tea, which is actually uh, quite easy, I think. I shared already a YouTube link with an um, uh, instruction how to do that and dip the roots into the compost tea before planting. And what else? You could uh, go to a kind of natural forest or any any healthy oh, sorry any healthy forest system in your region and take uh, take a bucket or two of forest soil and just spread it while planting uh, on your site on your soil in order to inoculate your newly planted system with uh, with fungus and microorganisms and after the planting it's really important to do the mulching so we were also talking about the different materials like straw hay or wood chips which uh, protect will protect the soil from drying out so uh, yeah the the mulching layer will hold water in the soil and also slowly decompose to humus and it will also suppress the growth of weedy plants during the first two or three years until uh, all the trees and shrubs have reached um, yeah reached a mature a more mature state where they uh, can be uh, yeah competed by these by these weeds so this only as a brief summary and now we come to the next chapter which is design um, yeah to in order to make a good plan and to communicate your plan within the group but also i just uh yeah tapped into your conversation but in order to communicate your project it's very nice to um yeah to create a design and i will show you how actually we are doing it in a very very simple way but uh yeah you know, once you you've done it, you can uh, communicate with important stakeholders and the media your ideas way better than only in text form. So the simple way would be detect the area with Google Earth. This is what you see here on the screenshot, um, and then measure the exact size using the poly polygon function. So when you are in Google Earth, you can just there. Very simple, some simple functions, and you can just uh, use the polygon function. You create the shape, you mark the shape of your area, and then it will calculate um, yeah, the exact size of your project site. So you have this top view and you have some data to it. And then you can use PowerPoint to draw a very simple, simple but complete map. And uh, also, I think I don't have an example of that, but you can measure different sub areas with Google Earth as well. So this is a plan which I did based on a drone imagery. So very, very simple, but definitely sufficient to work with it. And as you can see here, I think when you, when you found um, a uh, proper site for your project it will be very easy to uh, yeah to get a, some drone image i mean so many people are flying drones these days so you will definitely find someone and uh, once you have this image you can really easily create some shapes and yeah distinguish the different areas and elements of your project with with colors from each other. So probably there are even people who are more talented in, in using these programs uh, or more arty. But uh, yeah, this is how we as professionals uh, are actually doing it. And here you can see like the different elements. Uh, we have like a classical Miyawaki forest in this design. We have a food forest part in this design and we have this wild flower meadow. We have a um, standing deadwood insect hotel. We have this outdoor classroom and um, a path leading through through the whole area. We have some deadwood locks. And all this is marked in this very simple plan. And this is how it looked right 
during the planting action and this is me walking through there so you see like a very simple plan becoming reality and yeah it gives you a good orientation on yeah like like the different scales um yeah and just the measurements of the site so here again you see at the uh, right bottom corner this insect hotel you see the path green's classroom um yeah the area area right here at the end of the of the site is the miyawaki forest and here this has been planted later the food forest area <clears throat> so in general your tiny forest can have any shape you want basically here just some examples of young tiny forests in the netherlands and these pictures should just illustrate that yeah if it's a triangle or if it's a circle or i don't know you know any shape you can imagine is possible and it should yeah come from your creativity but also include the interests you or your group have so do you want a big outdoor classroom do you want to plant some uh, fruit and nut trees i don't know which should be easily accessible it really depends and it also depends on the actual site you're going to find but just to illustrate like there's a lot of space for any shape you want um last time this slide should have been the end so we I was a little bit too slow, but anyway, just in, bet in between some research questions for you, just to take away, um, maybe you have already uh, worked on some of these questions, but uh, yeah, you remember we were all also talking last time about the plant selection and how to find out which plants should, could be useful for your tiny forest and which plants are native in your region. So the first re research question would be research local plants and also very important, their accessibility. So, yeah, you must make sure that the plants you want to integrate into your tiny forest are also available or grown somewhere, or at least that you have access to seeds that you can let them germinate and grow your own seedlings. Ask around which soil additives are available in your area also very important so um, i know that in germany it's it's very easy if you for example ask uh, local farmers they will definitely have manure they will have straw they will have wood chips they could also help with machinery to uh, support the soil preparation and also of course there are um, yeah there are companies and uh, yeah, who provide also more high quality materials like for example the biochar or biological compost so i don't know the exact situation in gozo um because yeah every region of the world every corner of the world is different so ask around which additives are available in your specific area how much they cost and how they could get to your project site then another question, this is like, as I, as I said before, very optional, but might be interesting for you to become personally more engaged and practical, more engaged um, in the soil preparation. So with the instructions I sent to you, can you produce your own biochar or brew your compost tea yourself? Would be very interesting if someone attempt to do it please uh, send me information and photos if this process has been successful i would be curious about it um yeah look for suitable locations for the tiny forest i think this is what the whole project group is doing i don't know i like uh no exact information has me reached me yet but uh yeah, maybe also the group can look for suitable locations. Um, yeah, because everything really, like the whole project management really depends on where the project is going to take place and how the conditions are at this specific area. 
and also try to create your own tiny forest design using Google Earth and PowerPoint or other programs if you have more advanced programs or skills. Or you could even draw a uh, very old school just with a, uh, with a pen. Um, and maybe also in your Discord channel or wherever you exchange, you could uh, yeah, exchange your design ideas once you have the exact location and discuss about it. <clears throat> so now we are slowly becoming more practical and uh, we are talking about, uh, I think, the most important and most difficult step. If you, yeah, I, I think no step in general is very difficult on implementing a tiny forest. It's, you just have to get going. But uh, yeah, when you want to figure out the most difficult is probably a, a good soil preparation. So also, again, as a quick reminder, the soil is the foundation on which the tiny forest will be built. When we prepare the soil, we create a loose, airy soil that is up to a meter deep, contains enough organic material and develops a dense network of fungi within a year. Prepared soil consists of, of a subsoil, we're talking about it, a mixed layer with humus, the humus layer and the moist layer on top, as you see at the graphic at the right. Um, humus is organic material formed by the partial decomposition of plants and animals remaining uh, remains in the soil, which serves as an excellent nutrition, which serves as excellent nutrition for the soil. So this is all what we learned before in the soil science. Um, what is really important is that the soil preparations should be should be done one week, at least one week before the planting event, because um, in, it could happen that something uh, goes wrong or that you need some more time. So uh, we just lately had the mistake that we planned everything too tightly. And uh, so we couldn't plant all the trees at the date we wanted because the soil preparation just took longer because of some difficulties. So make sure that there is uh, a good buffer of time in between. So the first practical steps of the soil preparation. Um, step one is the delivery of the ordered soil additives. So you come up, came up with a plan, you calculated for your area, for the size of your area. Um, after you did the research, which soil additives are accessible in your region. Maybe you calculated, I need, or we need 20 cubic meters of manure and we can get some compost and some wood chip. And then, um, yeah, to give you an idea of how much 20 cubic meters is, as you see here at the picture uh, at the right, this, this tractor brings, I think this should be 20 to 30 cubic meters of material. So it's quite a lot actually. Um, to yeah to use so uh, you might need like uh, a certain area to unload all this material um, so you need approximately one square meter of area for every cubic meter of material you want to put there so make sure that next to the actual planting site there's enough space left you should be definitely present at the time of the delivery. So, uh, yeah, if you just um, order someone there to unload, I don't know, yeah, 20 cubic meters of material and you are not there and he put it on the, at, the, at the wrong place, um, you can't, uh, yeah, you can't change it anymore. So it's definitely important that someone with an accurate plan of how this whole process should uh, should take place is there and organizing this unloading process. And uh, if space is limited, think about uh, an order. For example, like for the actual soil preparation, you would need the manure, but the mulch material you would uh, need after the planting. So maybe you can finish the soil preparation and after you plant it or during 
or shortly before the planting event, you start to order the mulch material. So uh, yeah, try to be intelligent and also to place all the materials as close to the project site as possible because like every meter distance means more work, more time, more energy um, in order to get everything done. So uh, you're going to be thankful for every meter you don't have to walk or your excavator don't, uh, doesn't have to drive. Um, yeah, for the delivery of material, you could you could create a little logistic plan. I don't know if this is important in your case. It really depends on the site, as you see. When we are in a city, um, space is limited. So we have to measure like each road to make sure that the specific machines who deliver a certain product uh, is able to drive through here. And also, yeah, we have to mark the storage place, like the, the access road, the dimensions of this road, and we have to mark storage space so that you, you could send it to the person who is going to deliver a material um, and yeah, just double check it if everything works out the exact way you planned it. Yeah, in a rural area, it probably won't be a problem, but uh, the more urban you are, uh, the more houses are around. Uh, this can be very, very important to do this beforehand. <clears throat> so for the ex actual soil preparation, so when all the materials are there and uh, yeah, you're ready to start, you need an excavator or very important to mention, you don't always need uh, heavy machines. You can also do it with a group of people with shovels and a lot of energy. Um, can be quite tough to dig like 50 to 50 centimeters to one meter deep, depending on the soil. So you definitely would need uh, a big group of people and motivation. Um, otherwise, you can just order an excavator and a driver. And uh, yeah, you need all the required materials that you are planning your soil preparation with for sure. And what to do? You want to <clears throat> mix all the new biomass into the existing soil. And if you can create the different layers of subsoil and topsoil as we were talking about it, um, but don't be too dogmatic about it. If it doesn't work logistically or technically, then you can also just yeah, get the biomass uh, just somehow into the topsoil and create at least like a 30, 40, better 50 centimeter uh, layer of really loose and nu nutrient rich soil in which you have the feeling that plants will adapt well and where it's easy to dig later a hole and plant a tree. This should be the result at least. And if you can, technically, you can try to create these different layers we were talking about until a depth of one meter. Um, I brought, I think, two or three videos just to illustrate um, how this process could look like. And I will try to play it. And let's see if the connection is good enough that you can see the video. So I'm just going to start it. And maybe you can give me a short feedback if it works. Yeah, so what we can see on this video, um, I'll play it again, is this has been a very compacted clay soil, so former agricultural land. And in this case, we really digged uh, or opened the soil until a depth of one meter and added in straw and compost, as you can see here. So this is an example where we really uh, yeah, went to a depth of one, one meter, which we don't do in every case, but especially on dry, compacted and poor soils, this can be a proper way to do it. And as you can see, the machine, it's a big excavator. Um, <clears throat> and this is like 800 square meters. And I think it took us like two or three days. So uh, 
yeah, it's some work, but it's definitely doable. And in the end, we put some compost uh, as a topsoil layer, just like five centimeters or so. So um, yeah, this is um, yeah. And, and th with this example, you can see like uh, how we did it in practice. So in this case, we opened up the soil, we brought some biomass and uh, some nutrition into the soil, and then we added a topsoil layer in the end. Yeah, another example from a very recent project. Um, here we only went into the topsoil. The like the mineral soil was quite good. It was not like uh, not super bad condition, and we just added biochar and compost into the top forty centimeters. We did it with a smaller excavator, and like you will see in a moment, I think you will see the difference between the two materials. Um, so there's this dark biomass, which is the compost and the biochar, and now he's opening up and below is a more sandy uh, or clay sand. So the goal in this case was to loosen the soil until a depth of 40 centimeters and mix all the materials together. And yeah, <clears throat> a professional ex excavator driver can also hear like this work if we don't go in a depth of one meter is easily doable like i don't know in this case it were 500 square meters and we did it in two days so uh yeah also not not too difficult and here this is me and my good friend and it's just a video how your site could look in the end bam but nice, we we are going to see it again. Check. So uh, stop it here. Yeah, your ultimate goal would be that you created. Yeah, I, I was talking about it a lot, but that you created a nutrient-rich topsoil and uh, good conditions in the lower layers, and uh, this is how it could look in the end. Once you have done this, you already reached the yeah the final stage of your project, which is the planting day. And if you made it so far, almost nothing can go wrong anymore. Um, from our experience, the planting event is re is when I don't know, like how to say it? it's it's the most fun part because the community and people come together. In your case, it will be like. I mean, you will meet as a group the people from Gozo and the people from Germany. You will all be there. It will be kind of an adventure. You prepared everything properly. And then it's just to come together, plan together. Um, and yeah, the only important thing, like the very important thing, is that you have your shovels, that you have water to water the plants in the beginning, and that you have the plants, of course. But uh, once you organized everything well, it will probably be a, a beautiful day everyone will remember. Um, there are some important steps. And again, I don't know if this uh, is important for Gozo, but we usually build a fence. In more urban areas, we are usually using these uh, wood fences, which are no proper protection against uh, wildlife like rabbit or deer or anything. It's just uh, for the optics and that no one is just running through there or that, that the people who go out with their dogs, that the dogs don't, uh, don't shit in there or run through and digging holes and everything. So uh, it's just a little protection, but it won't protect like wildlife from uh, destroying your plants. Um, there are these wildlife protect protection fences, which we use more in, uh, in rural areas, so outside of the city. Um, yeah, I don't know which grazing animals might be harmful in Gozo. Maybe we can discuss about this later. But um, yeah, just to give you um, an overview of what should be considered and if you want to have a fence for whatever reason whether it's like a design reason or a protection reason make sure that you also order all the required materials for that step 
And our recommendation would be to put in the, uh, how, how to say, the posts, like the, <clears throat> uh, yeah, the wood things into the ground uh, before the planting day. So because other, otherwise you will have planted all your trees and then it's still a lot of work to do. And if you put your posts uh yeah if you set them right in the beginning before the planting day in the end you only have to fix the fence and this is a very quick step with some people so uh our recommendation is to set the posts right in the beginning like one or two days before the planting event or in between soil preparation and planting day <clears throat> second important thing is the plant delivery so uh, yeah, usually the plants, they either come with uh, naked roots. This is the case in Germany, like the uh, seedlings we are using in our projects. They are cheap and available during the planting seasons in spring or autumn. And uh, as you can see here, yeah, maybe you can see a little bit, they come in bundles and uh, have bare roots. It might be that you will get some... Uh, some plants where the roots are in soil, in containers, which is also fine, makes them probably a little more expensive. On the other side, uh, easier to store for some days. Um, ideally, you get your plants fresh from the nursery, so you don't have to store them for a long time because yeah, during the time you uh, store them, you have to take care, you have to water them, you have to make sure that they don't dry out, um, you have to have a place for them to store. So make sure that you can store them close to your area and that you deliver them, get them delivered maybe only one day or even in the morning of the planting event. Um, yeah, find a suitable place, yeah, as I said. Uh, if they come with bare naked roots, you have to cover the roots of the plants and you can do it either with fiber mats, like there are certain, you can use any fiber material that you just uh, put around the roots so that they don't get direct sunlight and that they don't dry out. Um, <clears throat> or if you, for example, uh, use wood chips for the mulching and the wood chips are already lay laying there, you can just... Uh, put the bundles of, of your plants in there and store them there for one day. Um, what's important when you store your plants for a longer time or if they arrive very dry, then water them directly. Because yeah, there's nothing, I mean, if you prepared everything well and then you don't succeed with your project only because you didn't take care of the roots or they were too dry and the plants didn't make it from the nursery until they came into the ground, it would be very disappointing. And then you have to just um, plant again. So make sure that you take good care of the little, little babies. Next step would be the layout of the area and distribution of the plants. So, yeah, as we learned, I think, in, in my first or second lecture, the definition of a tiny forest, uh, yeah, following the Miyawaki method, is that the plants are widely distributed. It's a high diversity of plants. There are uh, randomly distributed and planted very densely to simulate this uh, randomness and uh, yeah, like like this this chaotic uh, systematic randomness of nature. And uh, but still, we want to we want to guide this planting a little bit that we distribute all the different species. Uh, yeah, like more or less homogeneous within all the other species. So what we are doing is we take construction cord or any other cord to divide the area in uh, some sections which all have the same size. So at the picture on the left, you see marked how I or we would 
distribute an area into six, I know, could be six, could be eight, could be 10 different uh, slices of the same size. And then you have your, your plans that has been delivered. Here you can, in the middle on the picture, you can see a room where we start for one project, our plans. And then we created, uh, like in, in the beginning, they are uh, sorted by, by species. Of course, there's one uh, bundle of pine and one of oak and one of beech tree. And uh, yeah, then you would divide each bundle into the number of uh of areas you have yeah of, of different slices of your area you have so for example if you have uh, divided your area into six different um, pieces then you would take your 60 plants of oak and put 10 oaks in one area 10 oaks in the other 10 oaks in the other 10 oaks in the other and this you would do with each species until you have like a big bundle of diverse, yeah, of all species for each of the pieces you made. And this is like the only like preparation with which you guarantee that you have at least in each slice of your area and each corner of your area that you have uh, the same amount of all the plants you selected. And then within the different slices, the different pieces, uh, the people can just plant all the trees you pre-selected and plant them randomly within there. The planting distance uh, would be 60 centimeters from each other just by nature, because uh, yeah, if you have a certain area and you plant three plants per square meter, the distance would be 60 centimeters from each other. Um, yeah, and then later, it also really depends on how big your uh, how big your project site is going to be. But usually, we we divide our areas, uh, our project sites into slices of around forty to fifty um, sections. And so in each section, there would be 120 to 150 trees. And then it would make sense to have a group of around five to 10 people in each section, because if it's less, then it would be hard to plant your section within one day. And if it would be more, then everyone would stand on each other's feet. So uh, yeah, these are just some numbers some numbers uh, based on our experience that makes sense and yeah at the right picture you see um, the final pre-selected bundle or package of trees and plants um, of which yeah in each section would be one of these bundles final preparations like now you have already did like the biggest part of the preparation for the planting event and now just some guiding questions uh, for a successful planting and by the way here you see uh, one of our areas during a planting event as you can see the posts around the area are already standing um, and the first half of the area has been planted and now the people are starting to mulch the area so this is our a typical tiny forest of a size of 250 square meters would look like during a planting event. So the key points to consider like as a checklist before, who will be planting like, or who will you be planting with like, that you know how many people are going to come and when they are going to come. Very important because like we have made the experience when uh, yeah, when you are not organized very well, it could be that only 10 people appear or it could be that uh, 250 people appear and uh, you should find a balance between both extremes that there are not too many people uh, at the time and that there, but that there are definitely enough people to be able to uh, plant and finish everything in time. 
in your case, I think it's very clear because it, the planting will take place with your group. Um, but if you are going to invite external people, then make sure that you know exactly or more or less exactly who is going to come and at which time they are going to come. So, yeah, how many people are there at the exact same time? Very important point. Um, it's always good or important to have food available. So, yeah, makes sense that someone is going to take care of the food preparation because if you are out there planting a whole day, everyone's going to be hungry. So you don't uh, want to make them angry and provide them with proper food. Who is in charge of the planting campaign? Oh, this is very important. Like, um, I mean, you are going to make a plan all together. But there's there are always some people more engaged and some people less engaged, and you have to have like clear responsibilities. Like you could also divide the responsibilities. I don't know if you've already started it. Some could be really responsible for plant selection. Some could be responsible for the soil preparation. Some could be responsible for uh, social media and like all this uh, media work, public relation, press and so on. Some could be responsible for food and music. So that you know that you can trust that uh, certain important aspects of the planting day uh, yeah, are in good hands and that there's at least one person you know who's responsible for for this point. Otherwise, it could be quite chaotic. Um, ah, yeah, and then also who's going to take care of the materials like yeah, spades, shovels, uh, wheelbarrows, and so on. When everything is organized, it's finally, finally time to plant. And the planting consists of three very easy steps, which is step one, planting. On the picture, uh, picture at the top, you see a group of many, many people planting. I think we were like 100 people, mostly children. Uh, the project site a little bit too much, uh, so quite chaotic, but still worked. As I said, you are going to plant randomly mixed and uh, within a distance of 60 centimeters, so very densely. Then watering, I don't know what your, yeah, how your excess for water will be, but uh, usually you should water at least two or three liters per plant that the roots are really wet and can adapt good into the soil. And directly after the planting, you are going to mulch to directly protect the soil from transpiration and um, yeah, like, like cover the soil well. Yeah, and then at the end of the day, there's a tiny forest. You see before and after on the left, it it's a picture, our tiny forest looked only uh, right after the planting and on the right, it's after one and a half years. Um, and as I, as I said, very enthusiastic during the first lecture, it's really beautiful to actually see the progress and the development of a site you plant and planted. Um, one part, important aspect, this is now in German, but uh, just this picture should just illustrate uh, that you should set a schedule. Um, and as I said, like the schedule would be a step-by-step -step plan. So for the ones who don't understand German, on the left, it's like step number one, two, three, four, five, and so on. Um, the next would be the specific tasks. So uh, for example, soil analysis, um, the planning of the uh, soil preparation, creating a planting list, um, yeah, divide working groups and uh, give certain responsibilities until you order the plans, order the fence, order the wood chips and so on. Um, yeah, then this actual soil preparation, the planting day and so on. So it's a step-by-step -step plan with uh, all the action that should take place in the correct order. Then here you would have uh, the person or the group who is responsible for the specific task. And then, of course, the time 
the time until it should be finished and the status. So is it already done? Is it in progress or has it yet been, been started? Um, yeah, just create a simple Excel form, I think. And the materials, I also send you the download link. There should be a blueprint of this schedule. So uh, yeah, I definitely recommend to have a schedule like that. And uh, the last chapter for today, until we have maybe a little bit time uh, to, to talk or for questions, would be the management and maintenance. So in a tiny forest, a tiny forest in general should work like a natural forest, natural forest system. So it shouldn't need too much uh, caretaking, but to guarantee that the project is going to be successful, there are two very important aspects, which are the weed growth management and the watering during the first two to three years. And I will briefly go into it and uh, yeah, give you a little orientation on how to to do it. First, the weed management. So in the beginning, we have to define what uh, weeds actually are and why we do need uh, weed growth management at all. Yeah, we came up uh, based on the example of the organization Earthwatch, who are uh, uh, in England and very advanced in this whole tiny forest thing. And uh, I will explain how this strategy actually works and yeah, how it's done. So first, what are weeds in the tiny forest? Um, <clears throat> to understand or to define a weed in a tiny forest, there are three parameters which are crucial. First, the plant itself. What kind of plant is it and how much does it uh, does it spread? So, for example, if you have a very small growing flowering plant, which is only yeah, where there are only one, two or three around the whole project site, they're probably not problematic and not too much in competition with uh, the trees you planted. So it won't be a problem. But if it's a plant which is really growing all over the place and growing like 40, 50 centimeters high and uh, shading out all the trees you planted, then it might be problematical. Second, the location. So how much is the tree, uh, is this uh, weed or this, uh, yeah, this herb in direct competition with a small tree? So uh, if you have the feeling they don't interfere at all, then you could leave it in the forest. But if it's really all around the growing around the tree or above the tree or right next to it, then you should remove it. And uh, your own assessment. So when you look at it, what do you think or and what do you feel? Like, can this little herb seriously endanger the life of the young tree and really trust your intuition um yeah I'm, I'm not a fan from just uh giving instruction and say like you should remove every weed or you should do nothing but really look at your specific site and try to evaluate um yeah if this specific plant seems to be dominant and competitive and dangerous for the trees you planted. <clears throat> so, yeah, and these um, herbaceous or weedy plants, uh, just to define them, they're non-woody plants. So like, like trees are, and shrubs are woody plants. They grow several years until hundreds of years, uh, become thicker and thicker and bigger and bigger. Um, and these are yeah, woody trees and the herbaceous trees or pla plants are like, like grasses and things that come out in the spring and die in the winter and then they regrow again. Like, yeah, like grasses and all that other stuff. Um, <clears throat> so what we are only looking at uh, are all the herbaceous plants, uh, all the weeds that are at least 10 centimeters or higher. Everything else doesn't interest us at all. So they cover the soil, they grow roots into the soil, they support soil 
biology, they form tumors, and they will never ever be in competition with the plants like the trees and shrubs we planted. Um, so yeah, only what's higher than 10 centimeters is interesting for us. Everything else is ground cover, with, yeah, which keeps moisture in the soil and protect the soil from direct sunlight. So it's like natural living mulch, which uh, is going to die after the vegetation period and then decompose and become uh, nutrients for our, our forest. <clears throat> Why are we doing the weed management at all? Yeah, very easy and uh, partly I gave the answer already. So above ground, there is competition for sunlight and competition for space. And below ground, there's competition for nutrition and competition for water. So yeah, some more aggressively or dominantly growing weeds might be too competitive in the first two, three years for the trees because afterward the trees anywhere will overgrow the weedy plants and once you reach this uh, closed canopy layer after two or three years, there won't be enough light at the floor for weedy plants at all. So that this won't be a topic anymore. But during the first years, it's very important to take a closer look at these one year old uh, herbaceous plants. So I will introduce you now to the year one, two and three strategy. And yeah, on the right, you already see a group of people in a very, very young forest in the first year, like really strictly going to, through the tiny forest and taking out all the weeds. Um, this forest, for example, is now like three or four meters uh, high and very dense and nothing has to be done there at all. But in the first year, it's quite important and therefore you need your local group or community. So in general, like as the name of the strategy already suggests, the weeding only needs to be done within maximum the first three years. And each of these years has a, a different set of rules. After that, the tiny forest can be left with no management at all. And um, it's always our rule or our goal to intervene as little as possible, but as much as necessary. So year one, we have a low tolerance. So uh, everything which is growing quite, quite dominant, um, quite a lot, and is competing or has the potential to compete with our trees and shrubs, we just take it out. Um, take it out and maybe destroy it a little bit, like, like cut it into pieces and leave it in the forest as much. Um, in year two, the size of the tree and uh, yeah, your intuition, your feeling are crucial. So on this picture, we see one plant, like you really see that it's uh, growing. Uh, I, I don't know if you can see it, but it's, uh, it's called it's called Wicke in German. And uh, this can be quite dominant and growing growing up the trees and really pulling them down. So uh, even though the trees here in this two-year-old tiny forest, are, uh, some of them are really high and looking really good, uh, and it looks already like a jungle, this, this specific plant we would take out. Just take out, cut it into pieces and put it on the floor and do this one or two times in the second year. And uh, in this case, case you guarantee that uh, yeah all the trees also the uh, the slower growing trees which are not yet so developed and strong that they survive and year three is the relaxed management so on this picture you see a tiny forest which is three years old looks already super healthy and if there is any grass or herb or anything growing it won't endanger the forest at all. So don't worry, don't be too strict about it. Year three is, you only have to do something in year three uh, when the conditions were quite bad and there has been some mistakes or some aspects that, which uh, haven't been nice. So for example, I, just last week I visited a project site which has been implemented three years ago. Um, 
which is one of the only ones that hasn't been so successful due to um, um, massive soil compaction, which we underestimated. So we didn't lose the soil good enough and we had a very high pH value um, in the soil and uh, not, not the perfect plant selection in this case. So um, there are still some gaps within the three-year-old forest where the, the trees are quite small. And in this case, we still uh maintain the forest like in the year two but in general like when it when your forest develops properly then after three years there should be almost nothing not, there's nothing to be done anymore um so what do we leave we definitely want to leave as many flowering plants as possible the insects will thank you. So, of course, we want to provide with the tiny forest method, we want to provide the diverse oasis which attract life in general, where life can flourish. And uh, when, especially when we have flowering plants or some interesting plants, uh, be very careful to take them out. Uh, it's, it's way better to leave most of them in if you can. So if they start to grow too dominantly, of course, you have to take them out. But in the beginning, think always like, is there a chance that I could leave this plant uh, living uh, without, yeah, without risking that the forest in general won't develop well? So as you can see here in the circle, there are some flowering plants. Uh, they are not growing very high. There are only like two of them in the whole forest. I won't take them out. And as you can hear in the next example, like uh, here in the red circle, you see the grass. We are taking out all the grass because this is in a very early stage, but this is a grass which would grow very high and uh, all around the area. And this grass would take a lot of nutrition. Um, so we take it out and put it directly back on the floor as uh, a mulch layer. So we never ever want to take out nutrition from our system. Uh, we just kill them, make place for the trees again and leave the material to decompose in the system. And here in the blue circle, you see uh, the plants we are leaving. So uh, this plant will, it, will attract uh, different insects, uh, different pollinators into the system. And it will, it will grow uh, very, very deep and strong roots. So um yeah it will loosen the soil it will produce biomass and it won't harm our trees at all so next point how are the plants removed i also partly have been talking about it we try to remove the plants with the roots um but don't be like uh try to not dig into the soil and open it up too much if you can get it with the root it's fine if not don't dig a dig a hole and destroy the whole soil structure um, use a small tree as a landmark and then carefully remove any weed that you consider to be competing so that means uh, it can be a situation where there are weeds all around and it's really hard to, when you just go through it's really hard to uh, navigate uh, through the forest uh, during the weeding process. So it's always good to focus on one tree or shrub and then you clear around it. Otherwise, you have you can lose the orientation and it can happen that you, that you pull out a tree as well and we don't want that to happen. So try to focus on the tree or shrub and then uh, clear around it. Um, if you can shred or cut the removed plants a bit and then use them as mulch material, as I was talking about before. And uh, weeding is not always, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's not the task that uh, people are super, super ambitious or curious about. But I can tell you weeding can be a lot of fun especially when you do it together with other people. And it's interesting because during the weeding process, you get really close to the ground and the insects and uh, can be quite meditative. If you do it with nice people, good weather, and everyone is uh, 
is crawling over the floor, you will probably uh, detect or observe some things you would naturally not because usually you are not sitting uh, sitting at the floor in nature for hours usually. So yeah, just remember <clears throat> or consider that the weeding can also be a fun activity and then it's not too bad. And the second point is the watering. So again, we water as much as necessary, but as little as possible because we don't want to the plants to get used to unrealistic conditions in the future we don't want to water them so um, yeah it's important to just just when they really need water because it has been super warm and super dry uh, in germany it's between may and september when we when we water at all and only if it's really dry then we water about two to three times extra a month but not more. <clears throat> yeah, there, there are different approaches, and this would also be a task for you to think about an irrigation system, and those are going to be probably very dry. So, uh, yeah, think about a proper way to irrigate your forest. Um, quantity, approximately five liters per plant, which would be, for example, one third of a watering can. Um, yeah, so this would need you a total of 1500 liters per 100 square meters um, can be either done by a group as a group activity when everyone is walking around with a watering can uh, can be a lot of fun but it's also exhausting so if you uh, come up with a smart irrigation system this could be a suitable uh, solution for your case so yeah, discuss this with the local experts and see what other irrigation systems work in your region and uh, how much they cost, and then think about how you can, yeah, which one, which solution makes most sense for you. Um, just uh, yeah, I think it's now only two or three slides left. Um, just a little uh, inspiration that we can increase the effects. Or, yeah, when it comes to biodiversity through structural diversity and also uh, water re retention methods and just some inspirational um, elements. You could uh, build a field, field stone wall. You can create a bee meadow. You can add in dead wood logs. Just any, anything, any element which gives more structure, more potential habitats, uh, more species into your uh, project might be beneficial, fun, and interesting to implement. Yeah, and that's basically it. I think there's one other slide with uh, some more questions for at home, but I think I provided you now with all the information you would need for a successful implement, uh, implementation of your tiny forest. So have fun during the planning process and enjoy it. Um, don't be too frustrated when you face challenges, but more like try to use every challenge to come up with a creative solution because there's, there's always a solution. Uh, at least from my experience, like there are also often some frustrating problems or obstacles, but you can always overcome these obstacles, like uh, I promise you. And then in the end, this autumn, you will uh, most probably have planted your own tiny forest with which you can have uh, fun in the future. Yeah, and some homework uh, based on the lecture I gave would be create an Excel table with all important milestones for a successful project and also discuss about uh, responsibilities. Then, yeah, what I was just talking about, which irrigation systems are used in your area, where can you get one, what does it cost, and yeah, importantly, where is the next water source you can use. And uh, oh yeah, and the responsibilities. Who is responsible for public relation, food, planting design, and all the other aspects of the planting day? Yeah, that's it for the moment. I don't know how your uh, 
how, how the time slot is. I mean, I came half an hour later, so um, maybe we are already done. Maybe there's space for questions. I don't know. Uh, yeah, I think, thank you very much, uh, first of all, Stefan. Um, that was very informative. Uh, so we'll see if there are any more questions here regarding this. I think it, it has been a lot and, um, you know, it probably takes a while to digest everything, but... Uh... <laughs> yeah, maybe I can also, like, just a general offer. Um... I'm not yet in the Discord channel. I don't know. Maybe I don't know if I have been invited. I have to check that. But uh, I'll send you. Yeah. I'll send you an invitation. I'll send you an invitation. Okay. Okay. Cool. And uh, yeah, so you can contact me uh, through Discord or also uh, via email. And I'm always, even though like the official lectures are over, I'm very interested that the project in the end is successful. So I will be always open to answer questions for sure. So uh, if the if you work through all the material and if you are in the, uh, yeah, if you get deeper into the project management and questions arise, just let me know. Thank you very much. That's very much appreciated. And if there are no more questions at this point, then I guess we'll end it at, at this point. We'll end the lecture here. But you heard Stefan, uh, he is available on Discord. And if they, if some questions pop up later, then feel free to ask them. Okay, then right. have a great week, everyone. Thank you so much for coming, Stefan. Um, it's been a pleasure. And um, yeah, we'll see each other soon. Take care. Bye -bye. Good evening. Ciao, ciao. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Goodbye.